You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 86. What is the Free State Project? Let's go. Hey, so what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I've got on the show today a very interesting guy who I've known for a couple years, and he's actually a client of Liberty Virtual Assistance. Uh, we've got Roger Paxton. He is on the board of the Free State Project in New Hampshire, which is the reason that I brought him on. But he's also the producer of Pork Fest. If my libertarian audience knows what Pork Fest is, this is one of the key guys that creates Pork Fest for you. And he's the founder and host of the Lava Flow podcast, which is part of the Pax Libertas Productions Network. Roger, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me, Ash. It's uh, great to connect. Yeah. So, Roger, what is, let's just get started here. What is the Free State Project and how did you hear about it? So the Free State Project was started, oh goodness, about 15 years ago, I guess now, as a, it was a thesis that uh, Jason Sorens was doing for um, for one of his degrees, and was basically a an idea of bringing a bunch of libertarians, 20,000, to one small state so they could centralize their, their activism, their voting, you know, wh- whatever libertarians can do to make um, the the that state the freest state in the country possibly, um, and and exert the the maximum effort that they could to make that happen. Um, so it started you know like I said about 15 years ago, they looked at 10 different states. Uh, New Hampshire won the vote, and uh, so then people started moving here almost immediately. Uh, you know 10 or 12 years ago. Um, as a matter of fact, I know several people who have been here for 10 years, and um, I first found out about it in 2010, I believe it was. Um, at the National Libertarian Party Convention. They had a booth there, uh, of all things. And my wife and I were talking to the folks. And, you know, I'm from Arkansas. You know, I'm from the deep south. I'm from hot, humid, you know, and that's what I loved, right? And I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to move to New Hampshire. It snows and it's cold. Um, So I didn't think about it for years. And then after being the chairman of the Libertarian Party for a while and, you know, banging my head against that wall, I realized, you know, I've got to do something different. Something has to change. Yeah. So we started looking at it again. And uh, so three years ago, actually, next week will be our three-year anniversary. Uh, we moved up here and have loved being here. It's been an amazing journey. So I believe you're a Ron Paul guy as well, uh, likewise. Um, you know, I remember him saying back in the 2008 election cycle, this concept of vote with your feet, what does that mean and how does the Free State Project tie into that? Well, you know, libertarian libertarianism is a minority opinion, sadly. And in order to be able to affect libertarian change, we really have to vote with our feet and get these people in one central location. You're never going to have a libertarian government in Texas because they are just so outnumbered. The same with California, the same with you know, most states in the country. You're never going to affect enough change to really have liberty in your lifetime, which is the tagline for the Free State Project. So, you know, getting 20,000 libertarians in New Hampshire, we can make a huge change. There are so many things going on in New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire has over 400 state representatives. So that means that the state rep to, to constituent ratio is extremely low. I mean, I can actually call my state rep on the phone and have a conversation with this person. Tell me where else in the world you can do that. Right. Um, almost nowhere. Yeah. And, and being able to affect change like that is so important. And that's why we're trying to get so many here. Yeah. And compare that, con- compare and contrast that with the federal government and your ability to actually affect change there. I have never actually been able to shake the hand of one of my representatives uh, from the federal government ever. Um, I've seen one or two from a distance, <laughs> but that's the closest. And every once in a while, I'll get, you know, when I was active in, in politics, I would get a, you know, a form letter back if I sent an email to, <laughs> to my representative. And that's about the interaction you get. And of course, you know that it's making no difference. You know you're not making any real change. Yeah. Here, you can actually influence your representatives and make change. Yeah. And, and as like, a matter of fact, we have over two dozen free state project members sitting in the state house as representatives right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, you said about 200? Uh, about two dozen. Oh, little, little two, oh two, dozen. two dozen. I was like, yes, 200. I wish That'd it would be awesome. awesome. 200. <laughs> this <is a> <laughs> utopia if it were 200. Yeah, years. right. Um, so how many libertarian type or like-minded, I don't even like to call people libertarian anymore. It's like, free thinking people, people who want to be left alone, 
people who believe in property rights, people who understand that governance on the local level is much more effective than governments, uh, governance when you start scaling up the chain up to the federal level or heaven forbid we ever get a, a one world government of some sort. Uh, you know, like like they're testing out in the EU right now with having, right. you know, the Brussels and every unelected bureaucrats meet in Brussels and try to represent, you know, what, what what has it been like for you as an entrepreneur to move to a place where you feel like you at least have some level of control over the governing body? Well, I'll be honest. Um, I never even considered entrepreneurship before I moved here. Um, mm. I thought I was always going to be, a, you know, a corporate drone. I was a director of IT for healthcare companies, and you know, I thought the best way to do that was to be a corporate drone and sit in a cube for ten hours a day, and you know, that was my life. And uh, we moved up here, like I said, three years ago, and being around all of the entrepreneurship here just lit a fire in me, um, like a, a fire like I've never seen. And as a matter of fact, just right uh, the week before Porkfest this year, I lost that corporate drone job. And because I'd been working on entrepreneurship and making things happen, it didn't matter. We're still making things happen. We're still, you know, making that income. We're still, you know, and now I'm living more free than I've ever lived in my life because I have that entrepreneurship lifestyle where I can stay at home, be with my kids, stop in the middle of the day and spend an hour watching Star Wars with my kids or whatever the case may be. Uh, my life has completely done a 180 and that's because of the entrepreneurship spirit in New Hampshire. There are so many libertarian businesses coming out of here. There's cryptocurrency businesses like library. There are, you know, regular mom and pop shops like a route 11 goods uh, in, in Keene. There's, you know, media uh, companies There's so many different libertarian type entrepreneurship companies in New Hampshire that if you're a Liberty entrepreneur, New Hampshire is the place to be. Yeah. And so what is it, have you been able to actually affect regulation to make it easier for entrepreneurs? Because you know every regulation yep. that the government puts on the books in some way, shape, or form restricts the freedom for an entrepreneur to create value and build their business. Absolutely. One of the big ones, uh, probably the biggest last year was New Hampshire, thanks to uh, thanks to you know, libertarians going and speaking to to our representatives, uh, representatives from library that I mentioned, uh, went and spoke at these uh, hearings, um, uh, free keen and in different places. They are completely hands off now in New Hampshire for cryptocurrency. There is no regulation for cryptocurrency in New Hampshire because of liberty entrepreneurs going and saying, hey, this is how we do business. You are going to cripple us right. if you put restrictions or regulations on cryptocurrency. New Hampshire, as far as I know, is the only state that is completely hands off. Yeah. And, and when you say there's no regulation, there's no government regulation, we still have all the free market baked in regulation. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, strictly government. Um, obviously, some, you know, some cryptocurrencies have more regulation than others. And, you know, the market will decide on, on that. And I think that that is absolutely the best way to do it. I prefer to use deregulated cryptocurrencies. And uh, that's the way I do business. Yeah, because let's let's follow that trail for a minute. Back in 2017, everyone was talking about ICOs and a lot of people made a lot of money and a lot of people lost a lot of money. And as soon as people start losing money, then they start screaming for Big Brother to come in and start regulating things. But l let's just think of how does the marketplace regulate something like ICOs, new technology, Somebody doesn't really know exactly what it is. Most likely the people screaming for regulation are the ones that are left holding the bag because they just tried to get rich. They didn't care about the tech. They didn't care about the community. Right. You know, the market regulates this activity. This is not value add activity in the marketplace. Pure trying to get rich quick is not really benefiting. Yes. Okay. It's price discovery of these tokens. So I can appreciate someone thinking that the price that they're buying is less so than the price that they can sell for. This is, this is just simple price discovery. But markets regulate people who try to, let's say, gamble on price discovery by rewarding the people who are right and taking that value and capital away from the people who are wrong as the price reflects the true value. Like, do you think that these people would invest again in these ICOs? Well, no, probably not. Well, and you mentioned that, you know, they didn't care about the tech. They didn't care about the community. And that was the problem. They didn't investigate. They just heard, hey, this is a get rich quick scheme. I'm just going to jump in without looking at it at all and seeing what, you know, chance it has of success or failure. And they learned their lesson really quickly. 
So, you know, most of those people, you're right, will probably never jump back into cryptocurrency, at least until it becomes more mainstream. But certainly they won't be, you know, trying to throw a bunch of money at ICOs that may or may not happen. Mm. I mean, have we actually seen a truly successful ICO yet? I mean, not really. And, and there's, there's a lot of reason for that. But a lot of it is because, you know, number one, we have a huge, you know, downturn in the cryptocurrency prices, which meant a lot less capital for companies to do things. But also a lot of the ICO industry were, were, were fly-by-night companies who were literally just trying to scam people. Others of those were, were ideas that really had no reason being on a, on a blockchain. You know, that's the latest buzzword. Oh, I'm going to put it on the blockchain. Well, not everything needs to be on a blockchain. Right. That's just the way it is. And a lot of those companies, like a blockchain VPN, well, I'm sorry, I just don't understand the idea behind that. Well, Why do you need to have a blockchain VPN? Yeah. I have a, a VPN that works perfectly fine and it's not on blockchain. Yeah, no, I, I know. You know the, I think you know, Ethereum is known as the, the blockchain that um, launched all these ICOs. And I agree with you, not very many ICOs were successful. And so a lot of people needed to lose a lot of money. I should mention that I think that EOS was probably the most successful project that ICO'd on Ethereum, uh, even though they eventually, uh, you know, created their own blockchain and now have a successful working product out there. But that's neither here nor there. Um, Roger, let's talk about Porkfest because I, I know quite a few of my listeners will know what Porkfest is, but quite a few won't. What is Porkfest? What's the origin of Porkfest? And what does like Porkfest stand for? Porkfest stands for the Porcupine Freedom Festival. And uh, this past summer in June, we had our 15th annual Porkfest. Um, Porkfest is basically a week of living our values. You know, we all go out in, into the woods of New Hampshire at Rogers Campground, and we spend a week, you know, trading with each other voluntarily, spending time with each other, and just living a libertarian lifestyle. It's almost like an anarchist utopia is kind of what I like to, to liken it to. But that's what it is, because you've got a bunch of libertarians and anarchists together. And, you know, a lot of people say it's the libertarian version of Burning Man. But it's really not, because a lot of Burning Man, Burning Man's great. Uh, you know, I've never actually been, but I've heard it's amazing. But it, it basically has these, you know, these communist undervalues. Mm. And whereas, you know, you can't buy anything with actual money and, and all of that. Whereas Porkfest is literally like an anarchist utopia. Mm -hmm. You can buy almost anything you can imagine from food to, you know, any kind of cryptocurrency to camping supplies. I mean, you name it, you can buy it there. Even some, you know, illicit substances, possibly, <laughs> allegedly. And, um, uh, and only, buy, only illicit in the government's terms, right, only exactly. illicit, only illicit through one corporation, AKA the government's opinion. Right. But anyways, right. absolutely. The biggest monopoly. Absolutely. And, and you can do all of this, you know, voluntarily and, and, but, but it's not just that it's also, we have speakers. So it's almost like a huge conference. We had over 250 events at this past uh, pork fest, everything from, you know, seeing your favorite podcaster do a live show to, you know, Ben Swan on the main stage, giving a, a keynote speech. I mean, we had it all. Yeah. No, I, I, and the best thing about Porkfest is that it's great for everybody. If you're single and, you know, you want to meet singles or if you are a family and you have your kids with you. I mean, my two kids are 10 and 12 now have been to every Porkfest the last three years. The first time they came, they said, man, this is better than Disney World. I, I, and only if I'd only known that, you know, years before, I could have saved thousands of dollars. <laughs> I, I was actually about to ask you, like, what do you feel about kids? You know, people hear this idea of anarchists and they, they, they think about scarf wearing, Molotov cocktail throwing, like, is this cop car flipping? Is this what goes on here or is? No, what you're talking about is authoritarian anarchism. What we're talking about is actual anarchism where people want to, to interact with each other voluntarily without any use of force, especially use of force by the government. Um, will you see a lot of people carrying weapons? Absolutely. I carried my pistol all week. You'll see people carrying AR, uh, AR-15s, AK-47s, swords, the whole nine yards but we've never had an issue because we all have this base of understanding that we are going to, to interact voluntarily. And if I don't want to interact with you, I'll either leave pork fest or I will go to another part of pork. Fest. Right. It's like a 200 acre facility. Right. Just go somewhere else. Yeah. So you mentioned that burning man is a bit on the communist side. And I would say maybe the anarcho communist, and yes. whereas pork fest is on the capitalist side, anarcho capitalist. I myself, uh, you know, agree with the anar anarcho capitalist, philosophy. Uh, but can you try to describe the, the, the similarities and differences between an NCOM and an NCAP? 
Well, so ANCOMs say that they, you know, want the end, end of government, yet they call for government assistance and, and communal assistance all the time. And as long as that's done voluntarily, I have no issue with it. If you want to have a, you know, communist commune where everybody comes and voluntarily, voluntarily lives in that commune and voluntarily pulls all of their resources, I'm great with that. The problem is that these ANCOMs are not so much against the state as they are against capitalism and corporatism. Well, I'm against corporatism as well, but I'm certainly not against capitalism. Whereas anarcho-capitalism believes in capitalism and believes that without capitalism, we would not be where we are today. And that also believes that capitalism is the voluntary solution. Now the word capitalism has been muddied quite a bit over the last couple of decades um, to where it doesn't mean free market the way that it used to. I generally prefer the term free market over capitalism, but, uh, but those two words can be interchangeable. Right. Yeah. And, and what do you think drives an anarcho communist? Like what, what is, what is their mindset? Because I know a lot of people are angry at the government and yeah. understandably so that they currently are modern day slave drivers. I, I make money at my job, let's say, they steal X percentage of it before I ever see it. You know, if basically, so I'm working for free for them. If that's not slavery, I don't know what the definition of is, but what do you think is the mindset of someone as an anarcho-communist and should libertarians and and free people and anarcho-capitalists try to pull these people in or, or try to engage with these types of people? Or is the mindset so incredibly different that their fruit is hanging too high on the tree? Well, I think that a lot of anarcho-communists believe that they want fairness, that they really do want fairness for everybody, equality for everybody. And they just see equality as different. They want equality of outcomes, whereas we, we prefer equality of opportunity. Um, and I, I think that that's a big dividing factor. Whether we should interact with them and try to pull them over, it really depends on the individual income. I mean, some of them are so, you know, vehement in their hatred of, of anything that, uh, that creates a profit that I don't think that they can ever be swayed. But a lot of the, the rank and file, sure. I mean, I, I've had conversations with Ancoms. You know, being here in New Hampshire, we, you know, we have our share as well. I uh, ran into some at a comic book store one time a couple of years ago, and they had, you know, all the Bernie gear on and everything. And right. I had a discussion with them about, you know, how the free market has progressed us to where we are today. I actually read an article uh, earlier today about how uh, infant mortality rate around the world, even in third world countries, is dropping dramatically. And that's not because of communism. That is because of the free market. Mm. And I think when you start showing people these things, even anarcho-communists, they could even, even they can start to, to understand. Mm. Well, I, I hope so. Um, I, I would love to s- switch gears here, Roger, and talk about sure. Star Wars. Because I know that <laughs> you, you love Star Wars and yeah. you make a lot of similarities between Star Wars and our current, like, uh, our current society, like wh- where, where did you start to notice this difference and just, just walk us down your thought path around like the similarities here. So I actually used to do a podcast with a friend of mine. It's on hiatus right now called resist the empire, a libertarian view of the star Wars universe. And it's still out there. Um, you can still subscribe to it. And, and basically uh, me and some friends would sit around and, and watch star Wars. And they realize that there are so many parallels to, to what's going on in our current universe. I mean, you've got everything from, you know, the, the religious zealots, say the Jedi, you've got um, the, the government, the empire, you, you've got smugglers. And these are, you know, black marketeers, the, the, you know, drug sellers or whatever the case may be. There are so many parallels and there's a lot of libertarian parallels as well. Um, you have the, the Jedi who at one point, you know, believed in, in true peace and voluntarism. Um, not so much, you know, later in the story, but certainly at certain points in the story they did. Um, so there's a lot of parallels there with, with real life. And I think George Lucas really did a great job of, of making a show that while very fantastical and very, you know, different than our world also has so many different parallels with our world. Mm. And so what is the force then? How does that translate into real life? Well, 
you know, that, that's a great question. I'm not certain that anybody can answer that. But uh, it, to me, the force is more of a, a guiding premise. And to me, the force would be similar to the non-aggression principle. While it's not fantastical and supernatural, it's a guiding principle, a guiding light um, that leads people to, to true voluntary interaction. Um, I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in, you know, mystical forces, but you know, it's great to fantasize about, I guess. Yeah. But could the force also be seen as the desire to use aggressive force? In certain well, it depends. I mean, if, if you're a Sith or if you're a Jedi, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a Sith, then absolutely. You want to tap into that force to, you know, take advantage of others and to, to exert force and power over them. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us about your podcast a bit, because I, I think PAX means peace, doesn't it? Yeah, so Pax, my last name Paxton, that's where I pulled the Pax from. Paxton actually means son of peace. And um, so Pax Libertas is Peace Liberty uh, Productions. And that is, we now have seven podcasts um, on the show, everything from, like I mentioned, the Resist Empire. Uh, we have an anarcho Christian podcast for Christian anarchists. And we have the Big L podcast, which is my latest one with Karen Ann Harlow's where she digs into the the minutia and the the you know what's going on in the Libertarian Party, the National Libertarian Party. So it's kind of an unofficial look into what you know what's going on in that party. And uh, you know we've got the Incap Barber Shop and uh, Central Libertarianism. We've got a lot of different shows. My main show, the flagship show that I've been doing for gosh almost four years now, uh, is the Lava Flow, and that stands for Libertarian Anarcho Capitalist Voluntarist Agorist. Um, and it's basically where I take the news of the week. You know, I, I give you, you know, philosophy, voluntarist philosophy, and then I break down some of the news items that the mainstream media are ignoring or that even main libertarian podcasts are ignoring. I, you know, get into these more esoteric topics. Um, and, and then, you know, I uh, do a third segment every episode, anything from, um, you know, statists are going to state. And, you know, I break down something that a statist said, uh, you know, on TV or something. And, uh, another yet another bad cop, right? Get into some story about where the cops are yet again abusing somebody else. And, um, so definitely check it out at paxlibertas.com. Yeah. And how did you get involved with the whole libertarian scene or how did you start thinking like a Liberty entrepreneur? So I first started, um, the first time I heard of libertarianism, I was 19 or 20. So this was probably 95, 96. And a friend of mine said, Hey, you've got to check out this Ron Paul guy. I was like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, he's pretty cool. He's got some great ideas, but, oh, man, he wants to make drugs legal. He wants to, you know, not have borders. He wants to end the wars. What? I mean, you know, he's great on some things. Right. And then I just forgot about it for a while. And then after George Bush, um, that's when I really was like, okay, <laughs> something's got to give because if he's a conservative, I'm not a conservative, right? Right, 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 if, right. if George Bush believes in liberty, then I certainly, you know, there's, there's a problem here. Yeah. So I started looking into, you know, what real liberty truly was. Um, so I started reading Ron Paul's stuff. I started reading Ayn Rand. I uh, picked up some Murray Rothbard. And, uh, and here I am today. And, and like, how do you communicate the ideas of freedom and liberty to your children? So we radically unschool our children. So we don't do any, you know, standard schooling. We don't sit at, sit them at a desk all day. My kids have never stepped foot in a government indoctrination center. And Good I'm for that. so thankful for that. <laughs> I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that is one of the most important things you can do for the future of liberty is to not indoctrinate your kids in, in our government indoctrination centers. But, you know, every day we run into something um, that we can talk to, uh, to our kids uh, about liberty. As a matter of fact, we were playing, uh, my mother-in-law's in town this week, and we were playing um, apples to apples, uh, some kids game. And uh, there was a, a picture of, of somebody, you know, hitting, hitting somebody else with a stick. And my 10-year-old, my youngest, um, he had, you have to explain what this picture is. And he says, this picture is the government abusing somebody else. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it's always, you know, just little things like that where we can show that, hey, you know, there are always better ways of doing things than using force. Yeah. So two questions here. What keeps you up at night? And where are you finding progress towards a peaceful society? So what keeps me up at night, you know, being a father and, and a husband, and of course, you know, recently losing my job, trying to trying to keep everything together has been, you know, it's been a challenge. Now, we've been doing just fine, but it's a whole new realm for me. It's a whole new universe for me. Um, it's It's been the most free that I've ever been in my life, um, but it's also been, been a bit stressful. And that gets better every day as, as you know, more things come into line. Um, but also, 
you know, the unexpected, um, unexpected violence or unexpected illness or unexpected, you know, anything that might harm me or my family. That's what kind of keeps me up. Uh, and what was the second question? I'm sorry. And where are you seeing progress towards a peaceful society? New Hampshire. Um, I mean, in 2017 alone, we had, you know, medical marijuana, we had a constitutional carry passed, uh, we had fire uh, fireworks uh, regulations dropped, we had 1,500 um, uh, regulations, business regulations uh, completely wiped away. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I think I mentioned medical marijuana, the cryptocurrency, um, and tr- that was in 2017 alone. This is only happening in one state, and that's New Hampshire. And if you are interested in, you know, truly achieving that liberty in our lifetime, New Hampshire is the place to be, hands down. Yeah, I mean, if you're able to find a community of like-minded, liberty-minded individuals, then it can create a lot of support. You know, someone like me who's a digital nomad, this is something I crave often. You know, I crave being around people who don't ask me who would build the roads. You know, I was just, right. I was just at a cryptocurrency conference in Vegas last week. And the conference closed down and it was the final party, you know, and everybody's around the bar talking. And it it still amazes me, Roger, that our perspective still tends to be so left field for most people that they've never even thought about this stuff. And, you know, I I actually now have a, a personal rule that as soon as someone asks me who would build the roads, I politely excuse myself and leave the conversation. But, you know, I I hear what keeps you up at night. I'm just curious, like, I imagine that having a like-minded community of free people around you gives you some sort of safety net. Absolutely. So, you know, number one, you know, moving from Arkansas, where we had a couple of libertarian events a year, to moving to a, a state where literally, if you look at the the Free State Project calendar, there is something going on every single night of the year where you can hang around with real libertarians. Right. Find me another place in the world. Find me another place in the universe that has that. There's not. I mean, right. New Hampshire is the only place. And New Hampshire is small enough that you can literally get anywhere in the state in a couple of hours. So it was very overwhelming for me as somebody who's, you know, very, uh, <clears throat> you know, very, I, I just, I don't, I don't, you know, usually spend a lot of time with people, especially in Arkansas. So it was very overwhelming for me because I had all of these things going on and you kind of have to pick and choose what you go do because, you know, in other states you you don't have that choice, but in New Hampshire you do. You can pick and choose the libertarians you want to hang out with instead of the same 10 libertarians you always have to hang out with. Right. But you mentioned the, uh, the safety net. So when I first lost my job, of course, you know, I mentioned it in, in some of our libertarian private groups and everybody just, you know, just wrapped their arms around us. They offered us anything that we could possibly need, even offered some financial assistance if we needed it. Um, I was offered, you know, several different jobs as far as, you know, going back to the, to the corporate, uh, to the corporate universe. And it was just was something I was not going to do. Mm. And actually, um, I even picked up a couple of projects from that, from libertarians in New Hampshire. And that's part of what's helping make, uh, make all of this work is those projects that I was able to pick up yet still have the freedom to work at home and, and spend time with my family. Yeah, I know that you're reading books and and doing voiceovers and stuff now. You know, I I follow you all the time on Facebook. I think that you have some of the wittiest comments and and best liberty themed memes, you know, (laughs) in in the entire social media space. So if you if you don't know Roger, I highly recommend that you check him out, check out his podcast, follow him on social media. Roger, how can people keep up with you and how can they keep up with Porkfest and the Free State Project? Well, to keep up with me, just go to uh, paxabertas.com or thelavaflow.com and get it all there. Uh, for the FSP, um, we actually, uh, we have now, um, you know, we mentioned that 20,000 number. We've had over 24,000 people sign the pledge um, to, to eventually move to New Hampshire and over 40, uh, almost 4,400 people have already moved. So we've got almost 5,000 libertarians in state right now. And the way that you can go and sign the pledge um, is at fsp.org slash sign. Um, you can also get all the information at fsp.org uh, for Porkfest, which is an event that you do not want to miss. If you've never been to Porkfest, you've got to come and you can get that at porkfest.com. It's P-O-R-C fest.com. And I'm really hoping to, uh, to get Ash there next year so he can be speaking from that main stage for us. <laughs> so just tell us what does the pork part of Porkfest mean? It's a porcupine. Okay. And why, why the porcupine? Is that the mascot? 
Yeah, so the uh, the mascot of uh, libertarians is is generally the uh, the porcupine because it's a it's a defensive only animal. It doesn't attack anybody. It runs around. It does its own things. It lives its life. But if you try to attack it, it's got you know it, it's gonna it's gonna bear it's, its gonna claws, so up. to speak, with those with those uh, spikes, and it's gonna mess you up. Right. So that's that's uh, kind of our mascot. Yeah, and, and and I knew that. I wanted to make sure my audience knew that. You know, we've got softball. Yeah, we got the porcupines over here the porcupine over here in the libertarian camp and the honey badger in the crypto camp. I think those are two amazing animals. I don't know who's going to screw with either one of those. Uh, Roger, Absolutely. Uh, you are a Liberty entrepreneur through and through. I really appreciate what you're trying to do out here. We're both this build freedom type of people. And I definitely consider you part of my circle, even though we've never hung out in real life, Roger, I still have not yet, not yet. We will. I have so much respect for you and what you're doing and the energy and ideas that you put out, put out in the world. Uh, I, I absolutely love it. So if I can help you in any way, please contact me. You've got all my details. Yeah. And, you know, I want to mention that because uh, a lot of, you know, starting listening to your show was a huge help when I wanted to become an entrepreneur here in New Hampshire and Liberty VAs. I mean, I literally could not do what I do without uh, my VA, Mike. He is amazing. Um, he's done a great job for me. He's actually taking next week off because he's going on vacation. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do yeah. without this guy? Because he's so great. <laughs> um, so, I mean, your podcast and your company, Liberty VAs, has been a huge help. So, everybody, please, if you need some, you know, some very inexpensive, you know, help with just about anything you could imagine, definitely check out Liberty VAs. Oh, uh, well, I thank you for that plug there, Roger. Um, so, until next time, everyone, you know what to do. Keep building freedom. See ya. <laughs>